According to Germany's central bank, yesterday the yield on the two-year shot finished above the yield on the 30-year boomed. This was the first time that had ever happened. An unprecedented, another unprecedented yield curve inversion out of Germany. Not only that, as of today, again, according to the German Central Bank, the curve has just gone crazy. The two-year rate is 212. The five-year bubbles at 2.04. The 10-year, 2.14. The 30-year, 2.08. It's just insane. In Ger and we never see this out of the German curve because Germany's boring. Germany is stable. The last thing you would ever expect is German curves to go crazy like they have. But that's not all. As I'm sitting here right now, the 10-year U.S. Treasury yield was two, or excuse me, 3.74%, which you probably realize that's less than the Federal Reserve's current rate that they're paying on the RRP. Now we've talked all along and quite for, for quite some time about the four-week Treasury yield, a Treasury bill yield being less than the RRP, but here we have the 10-year Treasury note well below the RRP, and that's not all either. As of, again, as I'm sitting here right now, the three-month 10-year spread is a ridiculous 47 basis points inverted. The six-month bill to 10-year spread is 82 basis points inverted. And that's not even the worst of it. Go over in Eurodollar futures, which is something we talk about all the time. We've talked about the growing inversion ever since last December, the progression in the curve. As I sit here right now, the euro dollar futures curve is inverted a, I'm going to check, is that 187 and a half basis points from the peak, which is right now at the March to June contract next year, all the way out to, to, to June 2025. That's an enormous inversion that has put the long end contracts implying lower yields than they had been in the middle of this year. The curves are going absolutely insane. Which means, of course, we need to talk about inversions. I'm Jeff. This is Eurodollar University. If you're, uh, if you're interested in memberships, exclusive video content, uh, subscriptions, research, where we get into all the details behind curves, Eurodollars, money, theory, history, all that stuff, check us out at, at the website eurodollar.university. As I said, memberships. Daily, daily briefing subscription, deep dive analysis subscriptions where we go behind the YouTube videos and really get into these topics. Again, the website, eurodollar.university. So, curve inversions. Curve invert, I mean, we're seeing some really serious curve inversions and it's not just treasury, it's not just eurodollar futures. Now we're involving the German curve in a way that has never happened before outside of a very, very, very brief instance in one particular segment of the German curve back June 9th of 2008. So already you're kind of thinking this is probably not a good sign. But in 2022, it's not just a single day, it's multiple curve parts and it has been since the middle of September. So the German curve inversion has been essentially unprecedented in its modern format. So to try to really understand what's going on, I want to go back in time to July 1981. And July 1981, because there's so many similarities then to now, a lot of differences, but quite a few similarities. Number one, of course, high rates of consumer prices. Number two, central bankers pretending that they're actually going to do something about it. And number three, those central bankers who are pretending to do something about it have no idea what they're doing, nor what the markets are telling them about the conditions in the economy, not just inflation, but also general macro, macro circumstances. So this is July 1981, the FOMC. They're having enormous discussions about money supply, which they couldn't figure out, which was true of the entire period, as well as what was potentially going on in the economy with, at the time, interest rates, both real and nominal, at exceedingly high, exceptionally high levels. Well, the first guy who's going to speak here, I'm going to read through the transcript for a little bit, uh, just a little bit to, to give you a sense of what the discussion was like, was FRB governor, so Federal Reserve Board Governor Henry Wallach, who starts out, well, just, he starts out essentially observing how the yield curve at that time was inverted, which is not something 
policymakers were at all familiar with, as you'll see in a second. So Henry Wallach, as long as the short-term rates are significantly above long rates, people have an expectation that rates will come down. And that is why they're willing to pay very high rates temporarily. If they ever gave up on that expectation, the yield structure presumably would flatten out. It's only then that we would see the full restraining power of those interest rates. Because remember, at the time, the Fed wanted higher interest rates, or it claimed that it wanted higher interest rates as a way to restrict the economy, therefore the uh, growth in uh, inflation. But the yield curve seemed to be fighting them on that because lower the rates were high in the front and then would go lower afterwards. Chairman Paul Volcker responded to Mr. Wallach's comment, I don't know whether anybody is enough of a historian here to know the difference. There have been lots of times in history when short-term rates have been above long rates going way back, which Mr. Wallach responded during the 1920s, as if that was helpful. Volcker then said, does this happen when the general structure of interest rates is going down, that short-term interest rates are persistently higher than long-term interest rates, and the general trend is downward? In the 1920s, I guess the trend was down. Does that make sense in the modern system, or was that strictly a historical artifact? That's something that they were trying to understand because, again, inversion was unfamiliar. It didn't really make sense to them because the Fed wanted rates to stay up and the market was saying, yeah, up for, for a time and then lower rates in the future, whether the Fed wants them to be lower or not. Now, Mr. Wallach replied, it seems very logical in terms of structure. Well, not really. People expect rates to go down and they do go down. Yeah, if people expect something to happen and more enough people do, uh, but back to Mr. Wallach, in order to hold short-term securities, they have to be paid a premium. When they expect rates to go lower, you have to do that. Otherwise, as Mr. Wallach pointed out, they do like Merrill Lynch and start buying bonds, which is kind of where we are in the yield curve structure today. Not kind of, that's exactly where we are in the yield curve structure today. And Volcker, as was his, his usual case, quite honest in his ignorance, said, I don't know what the historical record has been because it's yield curve inversion is not something, yield curve at all was not really something that they paid much attention to. And why would they? The Federal Reserve up until that point was about, was a central bank. It was a monetary institution. Its job was mechanical, or at least it was supposed to be. It was never executed that way. But essentially their task was, is there or is there not too much money in the economy? interest rates, the term structure, all that stuff, the market sorts that out. The Fed just decides whether or not there is too much or too little money. But of course, they could no longer do that. They couldn't decide whether there was too much or too little money because they couldn't define it. They, could, they were struggling mightily to, to understand the monetary system, which they were supposed to be in control of. And in lieu of being able to define the monetary system, they were forced to begin looking at other forms of data and signals to try to piece together what they couldn't understand directly from the monetary system. So they started to look at the yield curve. They started to look at uh, economic aggregates like GDP or back in those days, GNP, the unemployment rate, just to see if they could say, well, we don't know what's going on in the monetary system, but if we play around and pretend we do, maybe it'll all work out fine. And here was a signal in the yield curve saying, it's not all working out fine. As Philadelphia Fed President Ed Bainey, I think it's pronounced, not really sure, kind of closed this section of the discussion by, by realizing and by, by saying, I have found in the last six weeks that the apprehension and the anxiety level have been increasing in the thrift industry. And here's the key one in small and medium-sized businesses. I think their expectation is that interest rates are going to come down before the end of the year. This is July 1981, year's half over. If this kind of view prevailed in the economy, I think we'd have a massive spread of heart attacks, which Mr. Balls has responded, starting at this table, because they did not expect, the Fed did not expect interest rates to go lower. They wanted to keep interest rates higher, but not just the market, also contacts in the economy were telling the Fed, we think interest rates are going lower. But why? Well, in, in July 1981, as it turned out, that actually marked the beginning of the 1981-82 recession. So as these Federal Reserve people were talking, 
they were not aware that the economy had already entered a serious, severe contraction. Again, that's nothing new. The Fed is always way behind developments because they don't know their job. They don't know how to interpret these signals. So as they were looking at the yield curve thinking, why are interest rates going lower? The economy was already answering that question. So that raises a lot of issues, starting with monetary policy, what role it has, as well as monetary policy makers' ability to actually understand the situation they claim to be in control of when in fact they're just flying blind. Whereas the yield curve and all of those in the markets who were trading bonds instead of short-term instruments were correct in surmising both the, the direction, the future direction of interest rates, as well as the reasons for it. The economy had stumbled. In the 1981-82 recession, not only was it prolonged, up until the Great Recession in 2007, 2008, 2009, it had been the worst economic climate since the Great Depression. So the most severe recession had already begun, warning signs telling the Fed that the recession was coming, that it was going to be bad, and the clueless policymakers having no idea what to make of it. Now, why do long-term rates go below, uh, go down below uh, short-term rates? As I said, it's not just about recession. We can break it down into individual cases too, which we should. The first is Irving Fisher's decomposition of long-term bond yields. As he said, more than a century ago, and it's been proven time and again, essentially long-term bond yields are nothing more than a combination of nominal growth and inflation expectations. So in the context of a recession, it makes sense that long-term bond yields would go down because the market is expecting less growth and less inflation. And in the specific context of July 1981, we got both of those things and then some. Because not only did you have less, less inflation, you had the, actually the end of the great inflation there. And the end of the great inflation marked by, as I said before, a absolutely nasty and prolonged recession. The second reason why you would see long-term rates go down below short-term rates is this concept of flight to safety. If you thought that maybe the recession isn't today, it could be tomorrow, don't really know exactly when it's going to start, but it, when it does, it will pay to own safe and liquid, in particular safe and liquid U.S. dollar denominated instruments, then you're going to want to buy longer term debt because you're going to want to be prepared for the environment where safety and liquidity are in high demand. And if you don't know if that's tomorrow, maybe skip the short-term stuff, especially if the Fed is trying to push rates up, making those prices go cheaper. For the longer stuff, where you're more reasonably assured that safety and liquidity will be in demand just over the horizon. That's what we saw in 1981, and that's what we see in spades right now today. Especially, as I've mentioned before, foreign buyers of long-term treasuries. And that makes sense too, because foreigners have a particular focus and awareness of the US dollar climate, which is another factor here that Americans don't seem to appreciate. We're sort of sheltered from the fact that we don't see the direct consequences of what's going on in the global dollar system in a way that foreigners actually do. So if foreigners are buying long-term treasuries, as we know they are, the tick data, then that means there's not just global recession here, there's also the potential for deflationary monetary condition, which I've talked about at length, don't need to get into here again. But suffice to say that foreigners buying long-term safe liquid US dollar investments, deflationary potential, which goes along with my first point, which is fisherian decomposition, what would make lower growth and inflation in the future period more than deflationary monetary conditions? So number one and number two actually go really well together, as does number three, which is the demand for collateral. If there is a collateral squeeze or uh, continued collateral shortages and scarcity, then it makes sense to buy the collateral now while you still can at decent rates. And that's the thing, though. If the 10-year treasury, which mostly is on the run, so we're really measuring the off the run, we're really measuring the on the run rate. 
If the 10-year treasury rate is already below the RRP where the four-week T-bill is, the four-week T-bill is actually a little bit less than the 10-year treasury, but those two things are coming closer together. What does that say about potential prices of collateral? The market is projecting lower growth in nominal, expectation, nominal uh, inflation expectations, flight to safety needs in the, in the intermediate future, as well as potentially the desire to own collateral today, anticipating and paying higher prices today, anticipating potential problems down the road. Which, if you remember anything about late September into early October, we've already been through the kind of sort of a rehearsal of what a collateral environment of that, that kind of severity would, would do. What that, what that would mean, not just to the monetary system specifically, but also I think starting to spill over into the real economy. And you look at the real economy, let's go back to that part of it. The macro environment is simply at best uncertain and at worst already in the toilet. We think about the latter category, China's economic numbers from just yesterday, uh, retail sales contracted half a percent year over year. And remember, Chinese retail sales before 2019 were never less than 7%, except for one month. Never less than 7%. Now, on the upside, reopening, celebrations in June of this year, the best they could do was 5%. And more likely than not, it's closer to zero. So China's a mess. Industrial production was back down to 5%, recognizing that the goods economy is sort of transitioning. The inventory cycle is swinging back to the wrong end, which is something we see around the world, including today, U.S. industrial production numbers not falling off a cliff, but sort of sideways. The month over month total was a slight decline. Uh, manufacturing in particular was slightly positive, but that's consistent with this transition growth period that I talk about uh, specifically in 2000 as well as 2007, you see industrial production sort of flatten out and then fall just like you see full-time jobs flatten out before they fall. Uh, retail sales were actually relatively good today in the U.S., but that I think misses the point where consumers are really cutting back, not just uh, not really on good spending as much as services. The ser U.S. services economy might be where the U.S. Treasury yield curve is particularly focused in the macro context because we saw yesterday with the U.S. Producer Price Index, services prices actually declined, declined by a tenth of a percent, but still they're not supposed to be falling. And that's, that's after last week's October CPI, which showed services less rent also declining, declining. And we've seen any number of soft surveys, PMIs, whether it be the Dallas Fed's PMI, the Richmond Fed's PMI, or S&P Global, and to a certain extent, ISM's non-manufacturing. But those first three in particular suggest that the U.S. services economy is struggling mightily. So when we look at all of these things together. We've got Germany. We've got Euro dollar. For, I mean, 187 basis. It's nuts. We've got the yield curve that's from the six month bill to the 10 year, that's 80 some basis points upside. The 10 years below the RRP, we have these markets screaming at the top of their lung, things are going to lead, are going to cause interest rates to go down. It's up to us to fill in the blanks because as we saw in July, 1981, or in October, 2007, Federal Reserve officials are not going to be able to do it. They are going to end up cutting rates involuntarily because they don't understand the situation. We don't need to make that same mistake. We can understand what the yield curves are telling us, which is, again, going back to Mr. Bainey, which was similar to William Poole's admonishment back in October 2007. But July 1981, um, increasing in the... Anxiety and apprehension increasing in the thrift industry and in small and medium-sized businesses. Their expectation is that interest rates are going to come down before the end of the year, in the short run. The Fed really should have listened to them in the same way Jay Powell and the Fed today really should start paying more attention to the yield curve instead of trying to tell everybody it's nonsense. They're, they're the ones with the nonsense, the yield curve, all sorts of useful information. And as I started out here, it's bananas, absolutely bananas. Now, I'm Jeff, this is Eurodollar University. 
Thank you for watching. Uh, as always, a huge, huge thank you to Eurodollar University members, as well as subscribers to our research products. Again, daily briefing, as well as the deep dive analysis. Tremendous thank you for those. And if you're interested in both, Eurodollar.University, or if you're any one combination, whatever the case may be, we're actually running a special at Markets Insider Pro where you can get my daily briefing along in a, in a bundle with Stephen Van Meter and Tracy Schuchart's offering. Check that out at marketsinsiderpro.com. There's also a special rate on the daily deep, deep dive analysis if you want to package both of those together. Um, it's our early Black Friday holiday sale. So until next time, thank you as always and take care.